We're pleased to welcome back to Dead to the World some old friends of the program, Steve Kimock and Greg Anton of Zero. Gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Hey, thanks a lot, Tim, for always supporting the music. Well, I've loved Zero for decades now. Um, you guys have a gig coming up. Tell us about it. Go ahead, Greg. <laughs> well, normally I wouldn't, but for a smooth talker like you. <laughs> um, yeah, we got a couple of gigs at the Mystic Theater in Petaluma, California, uh, October 23rd and 24th. Uh, we haven't played for a while. It's been kind of tough for a couple of years. Gigs being canceled and rescheduled. Uh, and now we're back uh, playing in California with uh, kind of a little bit of a new lineup uh, that we're excited about. And here comes Zero. Right on. Tell us the lineup for this gig. Melvin Seals on organ. Steve on guitar. Me on, <laughs> me on drums. Pete Sears on bass. Hadi Al Sadoon on trumpet. And we have a new guy, uh, Spencer Burroughs, who's going to play piano and do some singing. How did you, Greg and Steve, get together and originally start playing and form a band? Oh, I'd like to, I got my story. I'd like to hear Steve's version. Um, I guess we'll do an alphabetical order. Um, we were, we had a band called the Heart of Gold Band. And at this particular, we had some shifting uh, personnel, but at the time it was Keith and Donna God show and myself and John Kahn on bass, we we're looking for a guitar player. And we were at a rehearsal and Steve showed up. Uh, I'm, I don't know how it came that he showed up. That's the first time I met him when he walked in the door that day. Um, well, I mean, I didn't, you know, like wander in off the street or something like that. <laughs> Donna called me. <laughs> okay. You know? And I was at, at uh, it was when I, I was living in Lagunitas. I was taking care of uh, Joe Carroll's house. And his house was next to Randy Smith's house. That was one of my, you know, Mesa Boogie connections. I lived next door, to, next door to Randy when he was making his amps. Anyway, the phone rings at Joe's house. And I said, hello. You know, I pick it up. And the lady on the other end says, is this Steve Kimock? And I said, yeah. She said, Steve Kimock, the guitar player? And I said, yeah. And she says, oh, she says, this is Donna Godchild. And I said, I can't curse on the radio. I can't curse. You cannot. No. So I said, F you. <laughs> Who is You just didn't believe her. Huh? Yeah. I was like, get, get, the, get out of here. You know, um, <laughs> I didn't believe it. It's like, no, it's not. I figured it was some, you know, somebody was just giving me somebody pulling a prank. And then after a while, she convinced me <laughs> and said, will you come down and play? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And, and um, I don't know if that was the first time I went down because it, maybe it was because then she, she called again, you know, picked up the phone and went, hello. She says, is this Steve Kimmerich? And I said, yeah, Steve Kimmerich. She says, will you come back to rehearsal? <laughs> And I went down there and I sat outside this warehouse or something like that for a couple of days <laughs> and nobody ever came out. And apparently like she made these brownies and Keith ate them, except he didn't know how strong they were. And, and so they were kind of like stuck at home for a couple of days while I was waiting to get into rehearsal. So that's really how the band started. So and then did Zero start after Keith passed or did you start yeah. before that? And yeah, yeah, we, we had we, we did we did that band. I, we, I think we managed to squeak out a gig or two and then um, just 
absolutely tragically. I mean, the timing couldn't have been worse. Um, you know, Keith and Courtney were in that accident over on White's Hill. And uh, that was the end of that. Um, and it was one of those deals where as the smoke is clearing and Greg and I are looking at each other going, well, you want to start a band? You know, we thought we'd try again. Um, I mean, we tried to do it, it did, you know, again for a little, for a little bit with, with, uh, with, with Donna, but I, I, I think when she reemerged after the, the, uh, after the accident, after Keith died, um, she was like more in the church than in a rock band kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I figured it better like to let that be, you know, like not, not push it. So she was good there for a, a good long time. And she's still good, hopefully for a good long time. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, then, and it was just me. It, it was me and Greg, and we couldn't find a bass player. We didn't have a singer. We didn't know what to do. So we just sort of, you know, did our best to make music until people showed up and played with us. That's the whole thing.
<laughs> I'd like to say, Tim, that this interview with you, thank you for doing it, and with Steve, is for our listening audience, it says edifying to me <laughs> <laughs> about the history of the <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I never, it was a really long time ago, so I don't remember everything uh, exactly. So I'm getting the feeling like the start of zero, if you remember it, you weren't there. <laughs> it is, it's just shrouded in the mists of time at, at, <laughs> at, at, at this point. I mean, the, the, um, yeah, it, it, it was a really, 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 really long process of, of people coming and going and, and, uh, and, and finding our way. And it was just, I think, I think the neat part about it early on was the number of people that showed up that, you know, like everybody was connected to except one guy wouldn't know one guy, but everybody else knew him and then everybody else and everybody else. It was kind of neat. It, there was a, a, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of great musicians involved. Uh, ma many of them, um, uh, you know, gone to their reward, as they said. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you say that, you, um, you make me think of Martin. How did Martin come into the scene? Do you do you remember how that happened, or was he part of the Heart of Gold circles? Or Martin and I were in a band called the Underdogs before mm -hmm. Zero, and it was uh, um, it was a salsa band with an all Ali Akbar rhythm section. <laughs> the bass player was a Sarod player, since <laughs> passed away. There's a conga player. Uh, Tor Dietrichson. Tor is still alive. I think he's up in Seattle somewhere. I hear from him every 10 years or so. And then Pete Perringer, who was one of the cats in uh, with Mickey and the Digger Rhythm Band back in the day, remember Digger Rhythm. And um, also uh, uh, shuffled off this mortal coil. But I've been playing with Martine for a while. And then, you know, we wound up in zero too so yeah so you know what i mean it was like there was like little bits of it we're all together and then they mm -hmm. like would show up and then that was been it's kind of neat and over the years people have come and gone and come back and it's sort of like a big i don't know what the right word is collective family um something right because bass players would come and go and hey it's the it's the nature of the uh it's the nature of the trip at the level we're able to work, that not everybody's available all the time, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's just, you know, that's just that's just the, that's just the way it is. You have to be, I, I mean, to have like a really steady lineup, you got to be like so broke or so rich, you know. <laughs> um, we had just enough money to be hiring people that could get other gigs. <laughs> so they'd get another gig and it'd be like, hey, what happened to that guy? It's like, <laughs> oh, he's on the road with this guy. Then, you know, you get somebody else. I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong here, as I so often am, that, that you guys have some uh, music you'll be putting out soon. Tell us about that. Yeah. Greg? Greg's more involved with the album thing than I am. I'm on the East Coast. You know, I, I'm just doing dishes over here, you know. <laughs> Greg's actually working on a, on a, on a record. It's Come a, on, Greg. I've been working with Brian Risner, uh, who's just a master uh, audio engineer. And because of the pandemic, we don't sit in the same room. He's in Los Angeles and I'm in Sonoma County. Um, so Brian mixed our the zero record called Chance in a Million. Um, and then a couple of years ago, he said, which was from, the, uh, let me back up here. <laughs> we played three uh, nights. No, let me back up further. <laughs> We um, had a band called Zeros, mostly instrumental. Then w Robert Hunter started uh, off of writing some lyrics to our instrumental songs. And so we got a singer and started playing them. Dudge Murphy started singing. And we said, let's uh, 
let's play out and, and uh, play our new songs. So we booked three nights at the Great American Music Hall in 1992. Got a bunch of guys to play um, and recorded three nights there. We put out a record called Chance in a Million. A couple of years ago, Brian Risner calls me up and says, we ought to remaster that record because the technology has improved so much since 1992. I said, okay. He said, see if you can find me a couple bonus tracks and it'll make it more interesting. I went back and listened to all the three nights and I found another r record from those sessions that's as good as the first one. Um, so it's a, it was really special three nights. We had uh, Dan Healy, and uh, Don Pearson recording in the basement. We had two piano pl uh, players, Nicky Hopkins and Pete Sears. We had John Kahn and, and, and Vince Welnick also on piano on, on one night. Um, Bobby Vega, Martin Fierro, Liam Hanrahan. And so there's a new record. It's called Not Again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're just finishing up I got the, the mastered audio about a half an hour ago from Brian Risner wow. uh, and Jen uh, Kimmock who's putting everything together uh, sent me some artwork and it's coming together we'll have it out in a few months uh, I just want to say one thing about the um about that first chance in a million record mm -hmm. just because I, I i'm sitting here with my uh i'm sitting here with my supra ozark uh tuned in f because david lindley tuned in f Right, so I was such a big David Lindley fan back then that I was tuned in F all the time, and um, I had every other time we played this song, I played it in regular tuning on the Stratocaster, and we were at the music hall to record this record, and I had the Mustang Fender Mustang tuned to F for. Um, roll me over and I thought I don't care <laughs> that we're recording it it's in front of an audience I'm going to pick up this guitar that I never played it on in a tuning that I never put on played a song in that tuning that I never played before so the version of uh, Chance in a Million that's on that record is me playing Chance in a Million with the guitar tuned to F for the first time. I've never played it before <laughs> in that tuning. <laughs> it it totally worked. Good.
it's a it's a it's a good tune and that's a it's a good version but i literally i knew how it was supposed to go but i literally never played it in that tuning before mm -hmm. so that was that that was how um it's just like it's just another example of just the whole zero trip was like that you never knew what you were going to get out of anything or anybody martine you know would would get up there and play the most brilliant stuff on the saxophone or he would just like kind of shake a stuffed toy at the microphone and smile at the audience for a couple of minutes he just didn't know and 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 those were uh, those were equally likely outcomes you know that you'd record it and it would work in a tuning that you never played before or you'd, you'd sh shake a toy instead of playing a saxophone or something so that's Very why good. i like that band and that's why we went back all the time, sure. right? Because it was never going to be the same show that you ever saw. Never knew what you were going to get. Um, Greg, how did uh, Robert Hunter come to write lyrics for you? Um, I knew Hunter uh, from playing drums behind him uh, in a the, the couple different configurations. Uh, and then I ran into him at, at a party. Uh, it was a small party, six or eight people at someone's house, a dinner party. And I said, uh, he said, you know, that band Zero, it's a really good band, but uh, your audience is just other musicians in the Bay Area that, <laughs> <laughs> that appreciate it because you guys could get some songs and, you know, take it out a little bit more. And I said, you got any? And he says, you got any? <laughs> so I gave him some uh, instrumental zero stuff. He wrote lyrics to it. Uh, we got a singer, Judge Murphy. Martin got our singer, Judge Murphy. And um, the rest is history. As they say. I mean, we should tell some Martin stories, I guess. Yeah, that'd be great. And after you're done, I can say, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of my favorites is, um, well, I'll go back to that, uh, what I just said. <laughs> is So Hunter started giving us lyrics, and we started trying out singers for Zero. And the word got out that Robert Hunt is writing for Zero. And we tried out a bunch of guys. They were all great. And uh, Martin called me up one day and he said, I got this guy. He's got the pipes. You got to check him out. And I said, you know, Martin, I'm just taking a break from the singer thing. Um, just give me a week or two and then we'll get back to it. But I just a little burnout on it. And he says, no, you got to hear this guy. He says, just give me a little break. Okay. So in Martin's way, he shows up in, in my place an hour later with Judge. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Murphy. And he says, come on, Greg, give him something. So I had just come from Hunter's house and he gave me this song and I'm looking at it and it's basically a one word song called Catalina. And I go, and I couldn't figure it out how to make the, the, you know, a song out of one word. So I handed it to Judge and I played the opening chords to the song on the piano and he goes, Catalina. <laughs> and I practically fell off my seat. And so he got the gig right then. Um, and we worked with Judge for a bunch of years and he did a great job. How about you, Steve? What's your... Uh... What comes to mind when you think of favorite Martine stories? I was loading in. I was late. It was at the Wow Hall in Eugene, Oregon. I was late to the gig. I was at a session. I'd already been up there for a couple of days working on somebody's record. And I come crashing in the side door and I see Martine from the stage. You could see into like the, the dressing room. And he was just standing there in profile you know, making it like, you know how you hitchhike with your thumb out? He had his thumb like that. And he was just kind of standing there, hunched over, 
bringing his thumb like up to his face and then putting it back <laughs> down again and bringing his thumb like repeatedly and I'm setting up and I'm working he's still in there he's still he's like hitting his head with his thumb and then hitting his chin with his thumb finally it's been like an hour I've had enough i like Martin what are you doing and he says I'm trying to find my mouth <laughs> <laughs> I was like what he says I drank too much tea. <laughs> he drank this really strong mushroom tea, and he he wanted to play the saxophone, but he couldn't find his mouth. <laughs> and so, from loading, which is probably like a three or four o'clock in the afternoon, and he's like in the dressing room looking for his mouth. And uh, we go, oh, this is this is actually this is recorded on that on that live zero record. It starts with. Um, uh, I guess it's Tangled Hangers. Um, there's a long guitar solo. It's the one with the 50, 59 Chevy or something flying through space on a cover of that one. Ah. You know that? Go Hear Nothing. Um, yep. Go Hear uh, Nothing. Yeah. Um, finally, Martin could, could kind of found his mouth, right? <laughs> And so we're on stage, and he's standing there on stage. He's still like checking to see where it is once in a while. We play the song, we play the intro to the song, and then he goes to play, and he gets the horn, and he gets it in his mouth, and he's like triumphantly, you know, like assuming the pose of the the you know the the great tenor sax hopinist he was, and then he just makes this little sound like he goes. <laughs> and that was it. I mean, this one little farting kind of squeak, and then he put the horn down for the rest of the night and stood there tripping his ass off. But that's the version that's on that record, and that's why there's no saxophone solo on it. <laughs> so, um, zero is psychedelic music, and it sounds like you came about it the old fashioned way. Oh, yeah, on psychedelics. <laughs> Yeah, no, nor, normally I just make stuff up, but that's a true story. <laughs> that is a hundred percent true story. <laughs> Zero yeah, has said, a sh yeah. You said a lot of stuff that you can't repeat on the air. That's true. It was uh, really great. <laughs> we'll tell those stories at the gig. Come to the gig, and we'll tell stories. The gig is the two nights at the Mystic Theater in Petaluma. It is zero with. Uh, Melvin Seals and Pete Sears and um, besides Greg Anton and Steve Kimock, Hadi Al uh, Al and um, who's your singer again? Remind me. Spencer Burroughs and Spencer Burroughs. It's the Mystic Theater, the twenty third and twenty fourth, Saturday and Sunday of this month. You can go to mystictheater.com, I think and get your tickets there or zero the zero website's probably up and probably facebook and all that other stuff will have it as well
Drops of blood that trickle 